Christ Episcopal Church is a community of people who strive to glorify God, follow Jesus Christ, and serve all people through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the mission statement recently developed by the Vestry. This is our home now, but 150 years ago, we started somewhere else. That story is what I'm here to tell. Our story began more than 150 years ago with Thomas Walsh. He was an Irish immigrant, we think landing first in New York State. According to information he gave when joining the Society of Humboldt County Pioneers, he came to California in 1851 and to Eureka, arriving in Humboldt Bay on March 12, 1853. Somehow he may have made a detour to New Orleans because that's where he said he got his naturalization papers in 1852, every time he registered to vote in Humboldt County. He was a young man, about 22 years old, when he arrived in Eureka. We do not know with what resources he arrived, but he built a home, started a family, and built a dry goods store at First and E Streets. In 1860, he listed his real estate value at $1,500 and his personal property at $4,500. In the next 10 years, he grew both family and his estate. By 1870, he listed his real estate at $3,700, which, like, which likely included a bigger house and the personal property at $25,000, which likely included more goods for his store. It was during the 1860s that he worshipped with the Methodist Church. His wife worshipped at the Roman Catholic Church, and they were growing. And Thomas Walsh wanted his own church, his own religion. So on November 21st, 1868, he wrote a letter to the editor of the Times, proposing to build an Episcopal church in Eureka and calling it Christ Church. He asked for assistance from the good people of Eureka. To show his determination, he outlined the money he had already raised. There was $875 from his friends in San Francisco and $1,000 of his own. He told of the chime of five bells he had already ordered from the foundry of Menesley and Son of Troy, New York, and he had ordered an organ. He proposed to keep all the pews free, unlike some of the other churches that uh, sold their pews so that the family could always sit in their own pew. Into this process came another Eureka businessman, William Carson. If you live around Humboldt Bay, you've probably heard of him. Besides being in business in the same small town and doing business with some of the same people in other parts of the country, they had religion in common. Carson was an Anglican. He had to go to San Francisco to get married to his wife in 1864 in an Episcopal church there. That church, coincidentally, was named Christ Church. At this time, Carson was also young, and not yet the lumber baron he would become later on. He came at this project with some caution, he, it appears. Walsh had asked in the newspaper who would donate a site for the building. But it appears that nothing was donated. Carson did allow the building to proceed on one of his lots at 4th and E. The architect, George Fairfield, was hired, and his plans were shown for all of the town to see in Walsh's store. Lumber was cut and milled, and in 1869, the building began. It was not until January 31, 1871, that a deed from William Carson to Christ Church's rector, wardens, and vestry was recorded in Book 1, page 232, Town Deeds of Eureka, of a lot 110 feet by 120 feet on which the church stood for $8,000. It does not say whether he got paid that or whether that was just the value of that particular property. The church was finished by the middle of August, 1869. Tradition says that upon the completion, Walsh wrote to Bishop Kipp of the Diocese of California and requested a priest to be sent to provide services. It is also said that Bishop Kipp replied that he would be happy to oblige if they would just tell him exactly where Eureka is. Neither the Archive of Christ Church nor the Archive of Diocese of California has copies of this correspondence, but it does make a great story. 
Eureka's location must have been explained, as the Reverend John Gearlow arrived on May 21, 1870. He held his first service the next day, as May 22 was a Sunday. Parish organization had to be done first. So on June 1st, the church founders gathered to sign the Articles of Association. They were Thomas Walsh, John Carr, W.S. Brock, Thomas Carr, Robert Searles, D.W. Lindsay, George M. Fay, H.W. Havens, R.H. Whitmore, R.W. Brett, W.H. Johnson, John T. Young, and J.W. Henderson. As Gearlow was boarding with the Walshes, he must have been affected when three days later, on June 4, 1870, the Walsh's son, John George Beresford Walsh, died of a head disease. A second son died without a name on July 8, 1870, of a premature birth. Church business did have to continue, so thus on the evening of June 8, the church organizers met to elect a vestry which is the legal representative of the parish in all matters pertaining to its corporate property. The rector is usually the presiding officer, and the vestry usually includes two wardens. The senior warden is a support person for the rector and may lead the parish between rectors. The junior warden often has charge of the physical properties of the church. The first vestrymen were Thomas Walsh, senior warden, Robert Sears, junior warden, and vestrymen John Carr, W.S. Brock, Dr. D.U. Lindsay, John A. Watson, William Carson, and R.W. Brett. Their first official action was to elect Reverend Gearlow, the rector. Walsh did a fine job making sure the church had what it would need to function. He had acquired the chime of five bells, that is, bells of different tones so that a tune could be played. Some chimes had a full octave, which allowed almost every hymn to be replicated, but five bells could still do some of the tunes. He had a Mason and Hamlin double bank eight-stop cabinet organ. I don't know much about organs, but I understand from later improvements that this one had to have air pumped in manually to work. In 1870, they would have used the Book of Common Prayer authorized in 1789, because the next revision was not until 1892. The rector would have had one, maybe large size, to use in the service. How many others were in use at the church is not known. Personal size books, such as the small black one, would be used by those people who could afford them. Uh, later revisions were made to the Book of Common Prayer in 1928 and in 1979. The hymnals of the day, such as the one that they would have used from 1871, came printed only with words, making it look more like a book of poetry than a songbook. Without the organ to provide the music, I can only imagine the difficulty of trying to sing from it. Over the years, the revisions added and omitted hymns from that, those first ones, and you can see copies here of the 1905 and the 1940 hymnal. Last but not least, Walsh provided the Silver Communion Service that is usually on display as you come in the front door of Christ Church. So why does it say on this brass plaque, in memory of the Reverend John Thomas Shirtliff, rector of Christ Church, 1903 to 1916? The answer is that after some 40 years of use, it needed some restoration, which was done in honor of Reverend Shirtliff. Only a bishop can consecrate a church building and confirm parishioners as communicants of the church. At that time, only confirmed members, no matter where they were confirmed, could partake of the communion bread and wine. The Reverend, Right Reverend Kipp, as Bishop of the Diocese of California, was the Bishop for Christ Church. The archives for the Diocese of California are almost non-existent for the early years, due to an earthquake that you might have heard of in 1906. The resulting fire destroyed almost everything from the original Grace Cathedral, except for a few items hurriedly placed in a metal box and buried in a person's yard, thus saving those items from the fire that resulted from the earthquake. Among those items was a page from the Pacific Churchman printed in San Francisco on Thursday, February 23, 1871. 
Bishop Kip had promised to write an article, but rather than trying to do that about his trip to Eureka, he just gave them his journal to print. The page is three columns of fine print and way too much to read in this particular program, so it will be transcribed and available on the church website later. To summarize it, Bishop Kip boarded the Pelican on Thursday, January 26, in foggy conditions. Once they left San Francisco Bay and reached the ocean, the small propeller-driven steamer gave him a miserable trip. The waves were rolling and he was most uncomfortable. That night, he had to wedge himself into his berth to prevent rolling out of it. He hoped the next day would be better, but it was worse. It was stormy, and he had to stay wedged in his berth. About 2 p.m., they reached the bar of Humboldt Bay and fired guns to call the tug to lead them in. In Eureka, that was taken as a distress signal, so the tug came. While the ship was not in distress, the bishop said he was. At dark, they reached the wharf. Kip was not expected to be on the Pelican. He was expected on the next steamer, so there was no one to greet him. He headed to a hotel by carriage. However, Eureka being a small town, as he reached the hotel, Walsh was there to greet him, and the chimes were ringing a welcome. The next day, he moved to J.A. Watson's home for the rest of his visit. Because he had not been expected, his plan to consecrate the church, confirm a few folks, and leave again on the next ship which in four days did not happen. The church was not ready for him, so the consecration could not take place until the following Sunday, which was February 5th. He consecrated the church in the morning, confirmed in the afternoon, and then he was stuck in town due to weather and the ships unable to keep to a schedule. In the end, he was in Eureka three Sundays. He summarized it by saying he baptized one adult, preached 10 times, and confirmed 30 candidates. The steamer he thought he would leave on the scheduled Tuesday didn't but he was awakened early morning of Wednesday, February 15th, and told that the steamer would leave in an hour. He was there, ready to go, and by the next day, he made it home to San Francisco. Gearlow resigned at the end of 1871, having accomplished what he had set, was sent to do, that is, to organize a parish. He stayed until his replacement, the Reverend John S. Thompson, arrived on January 10th, 1872. Reverend Thompson seems to have begun with enthusiasm. The parish continued to grow. Then something happened, though the records do not say what. The church records were not carefully kept, and then they weren't kept at all. He did not officiate at services after November of 1875, and he officially resigned on April 13, 1876. The Reverend J.E. Hammond, filled in for the inactive Thompson until the vestry elected the Reverend John H. Babcock, who arrived on July 24, 1876. Bishop Kipp was finally getting some help with his large territory. Bishop Winfield became the bishop for the North and was based in Sacramento. He made his first visit to Eureka to confirm applicants in December of 1876, the same year that Babcock was hired. During that visit, though, he appointed Babcock to take over the church in Benicia. Christ Church was once again without a rector. Babcock officially resigned on January 8, 1877, and the Reverend E.C. Cowan took temporary hold of the parish, serving until May 19th of that year, when the Reverend W.L. Githens arrived. He served for a year. Early in the summer of 18. 78, the Reverend H.D. Lathrop arrived. He stayed for four years and resigned on June 1, 1882. Lathrop left as the Reverend John Wart arrived. Wart was a retired Army chaplain who did not mind retiring from the Army, but did not want to retire from the ministry. He began once again keeping great records and had plans for the improvement of the church and the rectory. He led the construction of a chapel for Sunday school and membership improved. We do know about him due to a printed sermon given on February 14, 1886 at the dedication of the new chapel. 
It was supposed to be the consecration, but Bishop Winfield was detained in his travels, so Wart held the scheduled service instead. When Winfield did arrive the next day, the chapel was consecrated, and 23 parishioners were confirmed over three days of services. When the vestry was elected on Monday, April 26, 1886, they finally had a secretary, J.H. Hodgson, who kept minutes for the next two years. The vestry still had William Carson and Thomas Walsh, but members not on that first vestry were Josiah Bell, J.W. Henderson, J.W. Fries, J.H. Hodgson, W.G. Espy, F.B. Thompson, J. Hetherington, E.W. Wells, and Isaac Baldwin. The vestry decided to meet quarterly on the first Tuesday of May, August, November, and February, four times a year. With the improvements made, the subject of finances again arose. Wart favored tithing, but several wives who were present at the meeting said it did not work in Eureka, would not work at Christ Church, and they did not want it. So the financial arrangements went on as before. The first action of the new vestry was to acquire fire insurance for the church and its property. The total value placed on the buildings, furnishings, and appointments was $8,000. The Sanborn insurance maps, such as the one you see, were used by agents to see size, composition, and placement of places to be insured. The arrow points towards 4th and E Street. 4th and E was the site of Christ Episcopal Church. They had a quarter block at that particular corner. That year, while attending the General Convention of the Episcopal Church in Chicago, Thomas Walsh died. The news was telegraphed to Eureka, and as a result, the November vestry meeting was canceled. His body was transported to San Francisco, and funeral services were performed by Bishop Kipp and Bishop Wingfield with other clergy available. Walsh's whole family was there. He was interred in San Francisco as his wife, who had died a year before, and other family members were already buried there. The exact places of the graves was also erased by the 1906 earthquake. Reverend Wart tendered his resignation as of the last day of November 1887, and he was persuaded to remain until a new priest could be found. The Reverend James Huon arrived in May 1888 and conducted his first vestry meeting on May 15th. On June 17th, 1888, he had the pleasure of accepting the gift of a baptismal font from the children of the Sunday School. I think it may be assumed that the children had some help raising the money for it. Sometime in 1889, Reverend Hulme turned the parish over to the Reverend William Leacock. His salary was set at $100 a month. During this time, the church was constantly in debt. Though there is no record when the guilds began, one is mentioned in the vestry minutes of January 1893. St. Agnes Guild paid for repairs on the stove in the chapel and purchased corrugated rubber for the stairway. The vestry members themselves usually bailed out the deficit. Carson more than once challenged them to come up with half of the money individually, and he would pay the other half. It always happened. Their bank allowed them to write overdrafts up to a set amount each year, much like we would do a charge card today. Vestryman J.W. Henderson was a banker, and I wonder if by doing more research it can be shown that it was his connection that allowed this arrangement. In April of 1896, it was St. Mary's Guild that donated $500 for current expenses. And in 1898, insurance coverage was reduced to $4,000 and the jan janitor's salary cut from $10 to $8 per month, all to save money. Leacock was active in his missionary zeal. He baptized and then had candidates ready for confirmation when Bishop Wingfield came on his now yearly visits. He worked with a Methodist in Ferndale to add a chapel for Episcopal services there. Yet he was living with a salary that had been cut from $100 to $75 per month. In September of 1898, Leacock resigned. He left in November. J. E. Shields, a vestryman and lay reader, filled in with prayer services, and on October 1898, an invitation was sent to the Reverend Caleb Benham, 
asking if he would hold the service in church with a view of becoming acquainted with our people. How rectors were chosen before has not been mentioned, but this was the first time that records show one being asked to visit before being offered the position. He favorably impressed Bishop Moreland, Reverend Leacock, and the women of St. Mary's Guild. As such, Reverend Benham of Napa was called and arrived on February 15, 1899. He was offered a salary of $100 a month for a year with the hopes that that could be extended. He continued much of the work of Reverend Leacock, helping to spread the church to Ferndale, Fortuna, Arcata, and Hoopa. And in January 1901, the vestry began a series of improvements to the church. In May, it was ordered that the church foundation had to be repaired. On August 6th, the vestry placed an order for the new pipe organ with a mechanical blower and instructed that the insurance be increased by $1,500 to include that new organ. In July 1902, the church ordered a furnace to heat the church. In the cool coastal, coastal climate, an unheated church for the past 30 years is hard to imagine. The city wanted to grade all the streets and the building committee was ordered to have the foundations of all the buildings raised where necessary before the grading. Since sidewalks were to be removed, money was raised for new sidewalks and the street paving. While the sidewalks were torn up, the basement of the church and the rectory were to be connected to the sewer. On May 5, 1903, Reverend Benham sent a letter of resignation to the vestry to take effect on June 1st. He was asked to reconsider, but would not, nor would he explain certain anonymous letters he had received. The vestry later suggested maybe they hire some detectives to find out what it was about, but nothing more was ever heard of. This shows changes made after the 1886 map was drawn. The neighborhood is now more crowded at 4th and E, and the church has a full tall fence running separating church property from its neighbor to the west. With the departure of the Reverend Benham, the temporary officiating priest was the Reverend A.L. Mitchell, who was succeeded by the Reverend T.W. Crook of Cloverdale. The Reverend John Shirtliff came highly recommended by Bishop Moreland, but the vestry wanted to see him first. He was invited to vacation in Eureka during the month of August and supply the pulpit at a salary of $100 for the month. He came, and the vestry was suitably impressed enough to offer him the position. He accepted and began his new duties on October 1st, 1903. Things moved along as they had been. Membership grew with continuing confirmations, but the finances continued to be an issue. The guilds were thanked for their contributions, and two new guilds are named, the Good Shepherd Guild and St. Catherine's Guild. When the rectory and guild hall, as the chapel is now called, needed new roof shingles, the church was left in arrears by $1,356.33 as of December of 1906. That must have been taken care of in the usual way. Then, in April 1907, the rector's salary was raised to $125 a month, in spite of an overdraft of $515. By August, the overdraft had grown to $751.59. And then, one of the bells cracked. It had to be taken down and shipped for recasting so that it would have exactly the same tone it always had. It would be several months before the chimes would ring again. And the overdraft continued to grow so that in February of 1908, it was $1,483.20. The bank finally had had enough and asked that the account be paid. Christ Church took out a regular loan of $1,500 from that same bank to pay it off. At the end of that year, not even the guild had any extra money to give to the church. 1909 was the same. So in January 1910, the church began a year of aggressive fundraising. Each member of the congregation got a letter describing the church's financial situation and what they should be doing to help it. The Easter offering came in at $1,670.45, presumably due to the letter. 
That August, the lower hall of the chapel was wired for electric lights to replace the old gas lamps. Donations beyond money were given. In 1911, the Eagle Lectern was given in memory of the Reverend William Leacock by Mrs. J. W. Henderson, friends and parish. The pulpit was given in memory of Mr. and Mrs. J. W. Henderson by their children. And the altar rail was given in memory of the Reverend Leacock. You can see these items in the photo of the church decorated for Easter. In 1912, William Carson died. He had been a faithful member and vestryman for 42 years. His donations sometimes held together the parish and often added to its beauty, such as in the beautiful altar he had donated. And in death, he remembered Christ Church with a $20,000 bequest to the build church building fund. The Reverend Shirtliff was given another raise to $150 per month in 1912. He continued to grow the church membership and keep the income covering the expenses over the next few years. His success led Bishop Moreland to request he be granted a leave of absence during 1916 to go back east to raise money for the diocese. The vestry granted the request. The congregation protested. The vestry canceled the leave. So in July, the Reverend Shirtliff resigned but agreed to stay until his successor could arrive. The Reverend Charles Ferrar arrived in September 1, 1916. The church continued with the ups and downs of finances and the increased membership through confirmation in the next couple of years. Moving the church a step forward, a quarter block of property was purchased on 11th and G Street. However, wartime precluded the vestry from doing anything other than planning for a move. And the flu epidemic of that year was so bad that it closed the Sunday school for the last six weeks of the year. In 1920, the vestry put an asking price of $30,000 on this church. By 1921, 4th Street had been graded and made into a highway. We now know it as part of Highway 101. They had to borrow money to pay the assessment levied on them as owners of property fronting that street. And during the next few years, they took care of business. Repairs were made on the rectory, paint applied to rectory, church, parish house, and fence. Previously purchased bonds matured and were cashed in and reinvested. And for the most part, the financial woes of the previous decades led up. In 1925, they could repair the organ, ensure the buildings and contents, and continue the general upkeep of the church properties. Reverend Farrar took time to have photos taken of the youth choir in 1927. Inside the church, it looks like much of what was moved to the new church has already been donated to this one. In spite of the fact that no one had shown much interest in purchasing the property, the asking price was raised to $35,000 in 1929. This photo was taken the same day in 1927 as the previous photo. On the far left, at the back is Bert Pasco, the organist. Also in the doorway on the right side is the Reverend Farrar. One of our parishioners, Carol Holland, says her mother is in that photo. In 1931, Reverend Farrar announced his retirement and asked that it be effective September 1st. The vestry asked him to reconsider, so he remained through the summer but made it definite in September that he would retire and leave on November 1st. The church isn't sold yet, but the area is much more crowded and noisier, with the highway going by on 4th Street and the streetcar line on E Street doing its turnaround in that intersection. In contrast, this view of the site, which would become Christ Church, shows only a dwelling that belonged to the Thomas Vance family. He had purchased it in 1885 to move away from downtown. The house was built for $4,000 in 1892, and when he died, it remained in the family until his deceased daughter's estate sold the quarter block for $2,500 to James W. Cochrane. Cochrane planned to build a four-unit bungalow court there. The Reverend Leachman arrived on November 1st, 1931. For the next five years, business was carried on normally. Then, in 1937, 
they began working more diligently to have a new church. In May, the quarter block site at 15th and H Street was purchased for $4,500 from James and Louise Cochran, who had not yet built on it. It was paid with $1,000 cash and the deed to the 11th and G Street property, where he could indeed build his bungalow court. Floor plans and sketches were submitted, and Mr. Louis P. Hobart of San Francisco was selected to design the new building. His fee would be 7.5% of the cost of the building. By December, final plans were adopted with a reservation to make minor changes. Hobart was an architect on Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, which was still being built in its new site after the destruction of the first one. Mercer Fraser Company offered the low bid at $36,935 to build the church and parish hall. They bid another $9,490 to build the rectory. The minor changes that had been allowed to the final plans brought the cost down by more than $5,000. Easter 1938 was the last service in the old church building. Parts of this building were put into the new one. Some of the redwood would be used. Fourteen of the old windows were restored and two new ones donated. The altar donated by William Carson, the pulpit, eagle lectern, and altar rails donated in 1911, all of that and more would go to the new home. On the 24th of April, 1938, Mrs. J.M. Carson turned the first shovel full of earth at the groundbreaking ceremony. It was reported that the first dig was near the place the new altar would be. On Thanksgiving Day in 1938, someone had made a large hole in two of the memorial windows, which had already been transferred and recently installed. The Humboldt Times expressed great indignation at, in their reporting of that vandalism. The notice of the completion of the new church was finally filed in January 1939. The Reverend Leachman, having posed at the previous building, posed at the new building in front of the altar. On April 19, 1939, Christ Church's new home was consecrated by the Right Reverend Noel Porter, Bishop of the Diocese of Sacramento, now called the Diocese of Northern California. Reverend Leachman was there as rector of the Christ Church. Reverend Reed served as the bishop's chaplain, and the Reverend Charles Farrar, returned for the event. This took place as the leading feature of the 29th Annual Diocesan Convention. The old property was leased to Safeway stores for $340 per month. Then in 1943, it was sold to Andrew Clark and his wife for the sum of $30,750. With a church in a new building and in good financial shape, the Reverend Leachman resigned on October 20th 1943, to become rector in Woodland. Bishop Porter suggested that various priests be invited to fill the pulpit for short periods of time so that the parish could choose from among them. Rob, the Reverend Robert Reed, who was known for being the bishop's chaplain at the consecration of the new church, was installed at Christ Church on June 11, 1944, by Bishop Porter. During his time here, presented three large classes for confirmation, a total of 98 new members, and also during that time he helped Bishop Porter in the establishment of a new mission in Crescent City. He resigned in August of 1947 to be effective no later than December 31st. The Reverend J. Thomas Lewis came from Coos Bay, Oregon in December of 1947. Post-World War II churches grew. Reverend Lewis enjoyed great success and presented large classes for confirmation, including the largest one ever presented in the diocese at that time and maybe even since. Eighty-three candidates were confirmed on April 3, 1949. In total, he presented for confirmation a whopping 721 candidates in the 12 years he served. He established the revolving vestry system, still in use, where only three are elected for a three-year term every year, keeping some continuity to the group. Christ Church has celebrated its founding over the years several times. 
I liked this clipping, though it's not a fancy, glossy photo. From left to right is Reverend Lewis, who is the rector, the right Reverend Porter, who is the bishop, Ada Carr, who is a parishioner, who as a 10-year-old attended the first service at the church at 4th and E Street. She had recently celebrated her 90th birthday and Reverend Farrar, who came back for the 80th anniversary celebration. The program for this event held at the Eureka Inn is the only place I have found Thomas Walsh referred to as a colonel. However, in the records of the Society of the Humboldt County Pioneers, it does say that he enlisted in the Humboldt County Militia in 1864. When so many are confirmed, there are lots more families with lots of children and they're all part of the church, and things get crowded. Lots and lots of children needed Sunday school space. This is the kind of problem many rectors would love to have now, but Reverend Lewis had to do something about it. In his printed argument for how and why the parish needed to step up to build space for the children, he said of this photo, the kitchen hardly provides this proper spiritual atmosphere for class instruction. He started a capital campaign, which was successful. On June 29, 1956, the vestry accepted the bid from C. Antonson for the new educational unit, which would include classrooms and a chapel. His bid was $77,470, and he gave an estimated date of completion as October 15, 1956, which is a really short time given today's uh, building timing. On June 23, 1957, the Right Reverend Hayden formally consecrated the new chapel of our merciful Savior. The chapel looked more like a small church with pews than it does now. The view into the small garden in back and to the tree is still lovely with large windows at the back edge. After the chapel was consecrated, the church purchased a lot on G Street to build a new rectory. The lot cost $7,500, and the E. Pearson Company built the rectory for $14,850. Having been part of the generation of children shown here, I have to confess that I remember very little of the content of my Sunday school class materials, but I do remember having to get dressed up each Sunday in Sunday best clothing, hat, and gloves to attend church and Sunday school, and to behave according to the way I was dressed. Did the choir pose in the new chapel, or was it used for choir rehearsals? No one at the original talk knew the answer to that. On January 12, 1959, after a church dinner, Reverend Lewis took the mortgage for all the new buildings in his hands, put it in a bowl, and set fire to the paid-off mortgage. Enthusiastic applause followed. On August 27, 1959, the Reverend Lewis submitted his resignation to be effective September 30th. He had accepted the position of rector at St. Paul's in Salinas, California. The substitute was the Reverend Richard Tumulty until the next rector could come. The Reverend John L. Jack Thompson arrived in Eureka in December of 1959 and began his duties as rector with his installation on February 7, 1960. During his tenure, he made almost all of his yearly reports as statistical information. Church attendance, baptisms, marriages, burials, etc. were all given in numbers. Others who reported in the annual report would provide the narratives to the activities of Christ Church. It was during his time that the National Church began a revision of the Book of Common Prayer. My grandmother remembered the fuss that was when it was last revised in 1928, though the Reverend Farrar does not mention that Christ Church had an issue with it at that time. Reverend Thompson was said to dislike confrontations, and I understood that there were many over this issue. It was a long and thorough process which included the trial service books to be tested in individual parishes such as these from 1966, 1967, and 1973. When he resigned as rector, it was to move to Sacramento to serve as the Bishop of the Diocese of Northern California. The Reverend Lloyd Gephardt took his place in 1979. He is the second from the right in this picture. 
and he had a difficult two years. He was left to deal with the less than popular new book of common prayer and to find that anything he did that someone of the parish did not like was reported to that person's best friend and previous priest, the bishop. Reverend Gephardt resigned in 1981. The Reverend W. Douglas Thompson, or Father Doug, arrived in 1982. He, he's the person on the far left in this picture. He used humor to deal with difficult issues, such as the con continuing dissatisfaction with the new prayer book. There were also ecumenical movements that he happened to be involved in. Christ Church did a cursillo with Sacred Heart Catholic Church, and then some Presbyterians joined as well, and other denominations tried it. People in Eureka found that maybe they had more in common than that they thought. They just expressed their religion in different ways. They ex Christ Church experimented with providing shelter for homeless individuals during the winter by letting them sleep in the church. However, the restrooms could not handle that volume of use, and that had to be discontinued. But they did continue to work with other churches to feed the homeless at the armory, uh, working to serve meals once a week. Father Doug retired in 2000. The Reverend Samuelson, who had been an assistant for Father Doug, began in a local church from which he was raised to be a deacon and then a priest. During the years he served, he worked wherever he was needed, whenever he was needed. And when Father Doug resigned in 2000, Christ Church had an interim rector, the Reverend Guy Sermon from Seattle, in the Diocese of Olympia for two years. The Reverend James A. McKenzie arrived in 2002. He proposed getting a new organ, one that, not would, one that would not require multiple repairs and would be able to do so much more for, to provide music. He led the campaign to raise the money for the organ. Plans were drawn up to see how it could fit into the front of the church, and meetings were held to discuss these things. Changes to the historical image of the chancel made the most trouble for some parishioners. Then Reverend Mackenzie left suddenly in November of 2005, and the Right Reverend George Hunt, a retired bishop living in the Santa Rosa area, came to the rescue. He traveled up to Eureka for a few days weekly until the middle of 2006. At that point, Father Leo arrived to serve as an interim rector. Though he did not have a warm and fuzzy personality, he knew how to get things built. He shepherded the congregation through the installation of the new organ, that, and that required the chancel area to be partially torn up and organ parts placed in areas in the nave as they were being installed. There was scaffolding, and we were not allowed to go into the church. Church services were held in the chapel. The organ was finally dedicated on June 8, 2008. Father Leo retired. With the new organ, a new rector arrived. The Reverend Ron W. Griffin and his wife came to Eureka with great enthusiasm. They were natives of Tennessee and had moved as far west as Colorado before coming to the north coast of California. Over the next few years, that enthusiasm waned. He and his wife went through the first earthquake and were well shaken. It rained more than they had expected. And their neighbor was not quite the person that they had hoped. They were most disturbed when he threatened violence across the fence. The Griffins left suddenly in 2012. The Reverend Susan Armstrong took on the position of priest in charge at the request of the bishop. Then in 2016, the Reverend Leslie McLaughery who in her retirement had moved to Humboldt with her husband, took over, while the vestry again searched for a rector. Through those past 12 years of change, the congregation learned how to hold the parish together themselves. They became stronger, friendlier, and much better leaders. While no one really wants to do all of that again, it was a God-given growth time for the parish. The search for the next rector brought the Reverend Daniel Dr. Daniel London to Eureka. The hope is that he and his wife Ashley will be here for many years. He is aided by two associates, 
the Reverend David Shoemaker and the Reverend Leslie McLaughlin, and two deacons, Pam Gossard and Ann Pearson. And that brings us to where we are today, Christ Church, Eureka. Thank you.